What's good, everybody? Andrea Renee here for this episode of the What's Good Games podcast, live from GDC 2024 with Alexa Ray Korea. Woo! I'm here. It's so good to see you, it's my friend. It's good to see you, too. And what an exciting year for GDC. I think this is the first time that you and I have done something together at GDC when you're a, a developer. Dev. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I went to the dark side. This is no, I've been the dark side. I've been waiting for this day. This is fun. I'm excited. I'm so glad that you had time in your schedule for me. So thank Always. you so much. Um, to everybody listening and watching, normally this would be your source for video game news commentary, analysis, and funny stuff. And our regularly scheduled episodes will come back next week. But since Alexa was here, I was he, like, he, he, he. let's record on the floor and talk about what's happening here at the Game Developers Conference. The floor. It's behind the beautiful us. Beautiful floor behind us. You can us. see it. If you're watching at youtube.com slash what's good games, of course. So welcome to GDC. You had a talk this year. I did. I had a talk um, in the Narrative Summit. And last year, I did a talk with the fabulous Liz Moberly. She's a fellow writer, narrative designer. She's worked on Hogwarts Legacy. She worked at Obsidian. Um, and most recently Lightspeed. And we did a talk last year about how to give good feedback in writer's rooms because feedback is a, is, is a skill and not, not many people do it well, frankly. But when we were doing, uh, like organizing the data from that talk, we realized that there was another talk which was feedback between writing teams and like design teams. So our talk this year was how to give and receive and have constructive, healthy feedback between design departments on games. And it was really dense, and it will be on the vault if you have vault access, but we got a lot of good, um, a lot of good uh, feedback from people who went and said it was helpful, and it was really nice. So I'm happy to have done it the second year in a row. It's an honor to talk here. Um, and I already have like three ideas for talks next year. So hopefully I'll just do it again. That's wonderful. <laughs> the talks at GDC are a huge part of the programming yes. for the show. And yes, it's a big are. reason why devs from all over the world come to the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco every year. And there's talks on all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And what an interesting part of the development process to do a talk on. Now I'm like, yeah. what are your ideas for next year? But I don't want you to spoil anything, of course. Oh, no. I pitched a talk this year that they, the GDC got a lot of submissions this year. We have, we have returned to pre-pandemic levels of developers submitting talks, which has been awesome. Um, but I, and last year they were only accepting one talk per, per person. But I have this amazing idea for a talk about baby girlification. Oh, okay. So like character creation using like modernized tropes and kind of like plumbing fandom for, for fandom for modernized versions of like old archetypes as you're making your games. Basically just making new fun characters that will get the, um, the, the, the star appeal and virality of characters like Asterion from Baldur's Gate 3, like Sid from Final Fantasy 16. Like how do you create these characters that stick with players? Um, stick with players long after they finish playing the game that makes them want to go sit on Tumblr for hours looking at content and keep engaging with your game. How do you make a husbando? How do you make a husbando? Actually, I should probably just call it that. How to make a husbando. <laughs> oh, You're welcome. that would be so on brand for me. I think I'm going to do, think that's what I'm going to call it. How to make a husbando. Husbando factory. Oh, perfect. <laughs> See, look, you can't write this stuff. Wait, we just did. Zing. Yay. Uh, well, that's really awesome. I'm glad that your talk went well. Thank you. Um, the show floor behind us has all kinds of booths where developers can go learn about tools yep. or meet teams that make software or hardware. Has there been anything that you've been wanting to check out in regards to like new tech or new innovation that's here at the show? There are quite a few narrative systems tools out on the floor uh, this year. And when I say narrative systems tool, to get in the weeds a little bit, it's setting having a tool that will automatically set up all the like little fields that you can put your dialogue in in a way that makes a conversation that's like branching so like Baldur's Gate style dialogue or something that's procedurally generated um, right now as it stands like a lot of us just hook that shit up solo in blueprints if you've ever played with twine or artisy or any of our uh, arc weaver or any of those she's tools. speaking dev everybody Sorry. <laughs> but if, you, if you've ever played with any of those tools it lets you set up like a little node and then you put your dialogue in it and then you can rearrange them and connect them and stuff like that but a lot more companies are building out tools that will you can say you know i want a branching dialogue with three different options that spawn three different options and you can actually just put those numbers in and then it will spawn all of those little parts for you 
and then have a convenient way for your writer to just upload all of that dialogue into the tool without having to individually, individually copy paste it into all the nodes, which I think is really cool. So there's a couple of tools here that I'm going to check out later this week that are like that. But if you're here for GDC and you're into that stuff, like go find them. It's so cool. And the devs who make them are so talented. Like I could never, I'm bad with numbers, so I could never be an engineer, but it's nice. It's really nice to see. Well, I don't think you're probably as bad as you think. Oh, but no, it's I'm okay to just say, hey, that part of the science of games is just not for me. It's not. I'm a, I'm a writer for a reason. I'm only good at making shit up. Um, <laughs> that's, the only, that's the only thing I'm good at. But no, like, I like failed math in college. Like, I'm oh, bad, bad. So you're legitimately bad at math. I numbers. am certified bad at math. <laughs> so that's why I'm a writer. <laughs> Speaking of tools and writers, yes. a very well-known writer announced a very cool project oh my on the God. stage of one of the game development community's most popular tools. Segway! Uh. Epic Games State of Unreal happened here this week. So excited. And Amy Hennig. Yes, I love Amy. I love you, Amy. Infamous <laughs> Amy Hennig, who is wonderful and has been working at Skydance New Media mm -hmm. on a not so secret project. I mean, they technically announced what she's working on. Actually, fully announced what her team has been working on and gave us the most beautiful trailer I think I may oh have God. ever seen. I saw it. Running in real time on Unreal Engine 5, 1943, the rise of Hydra. I can't wait. I can't wait. It's so funny to me. So this is, it's so funny to me. One, that, that game looks great and I'm so excited that Amy can finally show it. But Amy has been very influential on my career and I have had the opportunity to like, like she's like a good friend of mine, speak one-on-one. -on -one. She's given me a lot of really excellent advice over the years, which is I've taken to my dev life. And it's so funny because she's making a Black Panther game and I'm making a Black Panther game. <laughs> yeah, you are. And like, they're very different products. And like, I can't talk about mine at all. Marvel's, Marvel's upcoming Black Panther project is the legal way they told me to say it. So please look forward to it. Um, but it's so funny because I've just been like waiting to see more about hers because it's like, Amy, we're doing the kind of things that are maybe similar and I'm excited working in the same property, which is so cool. And finally being able to see it was just, it, I mean, it's beautiful, beautiful. I love that what the, the, the Black Panther, he's a little bit of an older gentleman. He's not like a young, hot, like 20-year-old Black Panther. I am all about the like older dude protagonists in games. That suit looks great on him. Like, Oh, yeah. Fuck. I, And I love, and this is a, such, a, again, a dev thing to say, but I love UE5. I love working in UE5. And it's come so far. And seeing that trailer, we just like, I'm like, oh, my God. Like, this is, like, this is it. This is awesome. I am very excited for that game. I'm excited for her. I'm glad she can finally talk about it. And I forever. really hope that Skydance doesn't weirdly cancel it. <laughs> no, if, 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 you're wa if you work at Skydance and you're watching this, do it for me. Like, do it for me. Please don't cancel that game. If you don't, do, do it for me, please. Do it for Alexa I want to play it. Um, no, it's so beautiful. And I think, um, I think the fan response, like I went and looked at the discourse and the response from fans, but also from other developers has been very much like, whoa, this is awesome. And like one of the cool things about being a game developer is we love looking at e we love looking at each other's shit and then learning. Like again, I'm at GDC, I'm attending all these talks. Like we love sharing like how we got somewhere and like methodologies that have worked for us and things that have worked for us. We love seeing what our peers do. And it's very much like a, when our peers succeed, we all succeed, rising tide and all that. So it was really excited to see that and then see the fan response and just be like, Fuck yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It oh, was I'm excited. really exciting being in the audience. I was at the theater where the State of Unreal was happening. And Amy, after the trailer rolled, did a live demonstration in Unreal Engine with someone from her team showcasing some of the graphics tools that they yeah. used to build that game. And I absolutely loved that they took the time to say, let's actually show you how the tools work yeah. and show you some of the cool things that this technology is doing yeah, yeah. and how far a lot of the animation and lighting tech has really come. Oh yeah, no, um, animation and lighting, I know some very um, amazing animators and lighting artists and like the stuff that they have to work with and the stuff they can do now is just like, oh my God, it's awesome. You can make anything, make, making shit up. It's yeah. so good. Well, and what's also great about what 
Epic announced today here at GDC is that in addition to like the professional level tools that they have and that a lot of your peers use mm -hmm. at your studio is the more prosumer, even hobbyist tools through yes. UEFN, which is the Unreal Editor for Fortnite. Them adding in movable cloth, which seems like a weird thing, but it's actually it's like the best thing. so cool. Yeah. I, I, if you're listening to this podcast and you're an aspiring game developer or anything, find this tool and go play in it because everyone's using Unreal right now. Unreal is the engine and if you know the tool going into, if you've never made a game before and you're starting from scratch, if you've fooled around and made a couple things in Unreal, it's going to give you a leg up on everyone else's application. So like learn that tool, pay attention. Learn that tool. And That's free. So, That's and for free. And they're so accessible too. They announced that they've paid over three hundred and twenty million dollars to creators in That's UEFN, which is great. So if you make something that people buy and want to play, you yep. can actually get paid for it, yep. which is awesome. That's and really cool. Not all of the platforms are doing such generous content creator payouts. So I love to see Epic coming forward and saying like we care about the development community. Yep. And then they announced some pretty big news that if developers ship their game, they're calling it Epic First Run on Epic Game Store, six months exclusive, they get to keep 100% of the revenue for the first six months. Wow. So is it, so it's, hold on, it's exclusive for to six months? In the Epic Game Store. Yeah, they're calling they it Epic keep, First Run. And they get to keep all revenue 100% for that. of the revenue. That's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good deal. I think it's so nice to see a major platform holder it like is. Epic saying we want to support the development community it because is. Lex, I don't know if you've heard. It's been kind of a rough year. Oh, I'm I'm in it. <laughs> I am I am in that trench watching my peers fall around me and it is up fucking setting. And the thing is a lot of those people a lot of a lot of those people aren't gonna find new jobs right away. I, I have a lot of friends that have gotten laid off in the last couple months. A lot of them are here, I've been talking with them and the problem is like not everyone I'll talk about my job function specifically. So not Everyone needs writers, and not everyone is hiring them. It's a very highly, it's a very niche s s skill, and all, but, and it, and there's more people that want to do it than like roles we have open. Yeah. So and narrative designers too. So all of these people are getting cast out into the void, and something like this that they could potentially make something themselves, an indie, make something easier, is a good way for them to find some sort of revenue, but also keep practicing their craft while they're maybe looking for that next big thing. So initiatives like that help the developers that you know are just having a tough time right now finding refinding that space for themselves. So, I like that. I like to hear that. That's yeah. cool. That's cool. It's cool. It was a little weird not seeing Tim Sweeney here because he has given the keynote, you know, for the last yeah. 15 years, but he tweeted that he is in Australia watching the antitrust Google and Apple case. Oh. We've talked about that case many times and I'll update you guys in next week's episode if anything comes from that. But if you want to follow it, uh, Tim Sweeney on Twitter has been posting, or the app formerly known as Twitter, I guess <laughs> I'm supposed to say, has been posting a lot of the updates that he's seen when he's inside uh, the trial room. So check that out if you're interested. But there's also all kinds of other things happening here at GDC. There was, oh, I think right now, right as, as we're going to wrap there's an amazing concert happening that Austin Winter yep. is directing. There's the concert. Or, or, um, conducting. Composing. Conducting. That's Composing. the word. <laughs> yes, there's there's the concert that's happening today. Um, also, I think today uh, there's something called GD Scream, where everyone is just getting together in Yerba Buena to scream. Oh, wait, really? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. Um, there have been a lot of like small developer pop-up things, like meet up here, meet up here, meet up here. But the GD Scream one was interesting. I wonder if we'll hear it. Um, That's so funny. And there's just been it's, been, it's been really nice to, again, like be among the dev community in this trying, this, the worst timeline, and um, talk to one another and support one another and connect people who are looking for jobs with people who are looking for people, which has been really nice. So I have no voice, as you can probably tell. It's because I've been doing a lot of talking, a lot of that. Um, but it's good, it's good to be here. It's good to be together. I like GDC a lot. I like GDC a lot too. I have gotten to play a few games while I'm here What'd at GDC. Play? I got to play Tales of Kanzara, Zhao. My man's from oh, Surgeon so Studios. Abu Bakar, you're amazing. 
He is fantastic, and we're hoping to do a longer form interview with him specifically on yes. his game. So you guys may recognize him as the man who was on stage at the Game Awards talking about this passion project of his that's dedicated to his, his late father. father. But it's and the best drip, too. That outfit. Oh, Amazing. He always has good fashion. Always. And thank you to Nintendo for inviting us to their Switch Partner Preview, where I got to chat with him and play his game, uh, which, of course, is coming to Switch. And I... Loved what I played, and I'll have deep dive thoughts on that um, at a preview soon, but it just is like such a pretty game that has so many levels of thought and detail yep. into it, yep. and I got to chat with him quickly about his passion for game making and how he got into it, yep. and he had a lot of cool things to say, so if you guys are interested, why don't you just take a listen right now? Do it. So, I'm Abu Bakr Salim. I am the creative director of Tales of Kinzera Zao at Surgeon Studios. I would love to hear how you came up with the name. Kenya. Okay. <laughs> Just a cool version of Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> so, my family's from Kenya, so I was like, yo, Kinzera, let's do it. <laughs> so, yeah. And Tales, really, it's, you know, for me, it's like I wanted to build a universe that pulls from kind of works a bit like an anthology, you know? So the idea is that this is Zhao's story. You'll have other stories as well as you go along. So that's essentially what it, where it comes from. It stems from this idea of telling stories within, the, within Kinzera, which is this universe and this world that I've kind of created, which pull from a lot of the kind of African myths and mythologies, but really all stem from a place of human truth. But like for me, it's all about essentially, you know, telling stories that stem from a sense of like what makes us human, you know, because I think as much as this is based on African mythology, in my head, it's like really, truly, it's, a, it's about the journey of grief and what that means and what that kind of tells us. So it can be Norse or Greek or whatever. Of course, it's African because it's my perspective and the stories that my dad used to tell me. But at its core, it's all about grief. And that's really, truly where, where my, the storytelling kind of elements come from. Nice. Is there an affinity oh. you had in particular for a side-scrolling Metrovania? Yeah, so the so the side-scroller element comes from a lot of the fact that I, I played side-scrollers with my dad when I was growing up. Sonic, Mario, those kind of games. So it was kind of paying homage to him on that. The Metrovania aspect is mainly because of the fact that it is, it is about grief and kind of throwing you in a world that you have no idea about. So really, truly, it's, it's almost like a mix of like a callback to him, but also a time of where I am now as a booth. Do you know what I mean? So. That's sort of where I've kind of pulled from as a whole. So really what's funny is like, I'm learning all this other stuff and the elements of what it means to like make games, like stick dead zones or like, you know, locomotion. I never used to know any of this stuff when I played games, like even, <laughs> like, even like FPS. Like I didn't know that there was this massive discussion about what FPS is and stuff. So like, it's, it's very surreal now being in this place where I'm using this language to kind of explain or express like, you know, what we're doing as a whole. So you're picking up all of the developer lingo yeah, you taught me. Absolutely. And it's it's very weird. It's very weird. Does it make you want to learn how to code? It actually does a bit. There's a part of me that does that is interested in the idea of what it means to code, because it is a language that fascinates me. Like the fact that this has been built from code in a way, you know? Like that's really cool. And so yeah, there's definitely that there's definitely that interest interest of it for for sure. I remember like during the early days of development, I bought like this this pack when Unreal were doing I think it was Udemy were doing like this, you know, kind of discount on like on coding. I bought this huge pack on trying to think like, yeah, I've got time to learn how to do this. I obviously don't, but <laughs> <laughs> You have a few other things going you know, on. Yeah, you know. I keep saying like, if I knew what I know now about what it means to get into the games, I probably wouldn't have done it. Yeah, yeah it's hard, right? It's hard, it's really hard. But at the same time, I think moments like the Game Awards and moments like, there was, a, there was even a moment after actually the announcement and I was walking from the venue to the hotel where, people were literally just stopping and being like, dude, that really meant a lot because I lost my parent or I lost my friend during COVID or I lost them, you know, during the time. And what you said really speaks to me. And, and those are the rewarding moments. Those are the moments where you're like, okay, this is, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So people don't feel alone in their journey of what's going on. Cause I know for a fact, I remember feeling so isolated and alone having lost my father and going through that process. 
So it's very surreal to be in this position now. It's just a very crazy process, man. Like I can't even, I don't even know how to put it into words. Like it's, it's exciting and terrifying. And you know, I, I feel naked half the time, but then I feel really kind of- A little bit know, of powered. imposter syndrome maybe? Yeah, I just feel like, cause again, it's like, you know, I'm, I, at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just this actor, right? <laughs> He's just kind of decided that he wanted to make a game and tell a story. But it's, yeah, it's very surreal. I wanted to tell a story that felt authentic and felt real. And I feel like in my head, it's, it's about being in control of my voice. And I think like, I can only do that if I am running the studio. You know what I mean? And, and I think, because again, like in film and TV, everyone does it. You write a script, you give the script to a studio, the studio changes it and it's a different script, right? But you've made your money and you move on. Right. Whereas for me, it's like, actually, no, this is, this is really personal. This is really, like something that I, I, I really want to, you know, paint and, and, and make sure that it feels authentic and true. And the only way I can do that is if I'm in control. So I'll take the risk. Absolutely. I take the risk of running a studio, but at the same time, at least I know that my story is authentic and real. And even what's been great about working with EA and the originals team is that it is, they allow me to be authentic and real, you know? So that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at at the moment, you know? I'm like, oh shit, people are going to be, be playing it and giving me opinions. If you could say like one thing to people who are looking at this game going, oh, that game looks cool, but I don't really know about it. What would you give them to be like, you should try my game because? Because it's, it's a game that comes from a very personal place. And it's not even just from one developer. It's not just from me and my experience of my, my father and my passing of the journey, but it's from everyone. I think everyone has put a piece of themselves in this, it feels indie. There is nothing that's been kind of tarnished of it that feels like it's been forced or being put there because it, you know, because it looks cool or, you know, we're trying to hit a zeitgeist. It's coming from a real sense of not only like trying to make a fun experience, but also trying to tell a, a story that connects with people on a human level. You know, you look at games like Journey, for example, or even like Ori or even Hellblade. These games I feel are connect to you and remind you of what it means to be human and that's the kind of game that we want to make with this yeah okay it's cool and fantastical and everything but ultimately it's about really what makes you human that's why you should try it you have known him for a little while yes we met at dice last year um being under the ea the ea banner because he's a, an ea original yeah so we kind of like met in that space but um, he's just, I don't know, like his journey has been incredible to watch. He was in Raised by Wolves. He was Bayek in Assassin's Creed Origins. Um, he's in the next season of Game of Thrones, which is coming out this summer. Which yeah, is really House cool. of the Dragon. Yeah, no, wait, yeah, how, whatever. I don't know what's going on anymore. Yes, you do. What year is it? House of the Dragon. And he, you know, was a guy that's just like, I love video games and I have this feeling I really want to work through that feeling and make a game so I can share with everyone what that felt like. We know a lot of people that have done that. Um, Fa our friend Ferris. Yeah. The show Ferris, it's Shout the same thing. Shout out to our super producer, Ferris. Ferris is, Ferris is amazing. Ferris is also here this week. I got to see him yesterday. Um, he, you know, had a feeling and it was, a, 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 I don't want to, not going to spoil it, but he had a feeling and was like, you know, I really want to, I want to share this feeling. I think I want to make a game. And he went out and like paved the way and is now making a game as well. And I love that when people come to dev, from that, from that place where it's like, I have a feeling and I have a story and like, I'm gonna therapize myself a little bit, but also it's just something I want other people to understand and feel. And you have these really beautiful experiences coming out from that type of development, so. Yeah, Abu Bakr was respect. telling me about how he decided to get into the game development because he wanted to tell the story and he mm -hmm. wanted to make sure it was told right. Yep. And in his, yep. in his mind, he was like, I need to do it because yep. I don't think me pitching the idea to somebody else and then handing over the storytelling to them Absolutely. is going to yeah. tell the story the way that I want to tell it specifically. Uh -huh. And all of the influences from Kenya and all the little touches that are clearly his background and what makes it so special and personalized to him, I think is really fantastic. And what I also thought was interesting about the conversation we had was he was surprised by how many people approached him after he made the announcement at the Game Awards yep. to say, thank you for making this game. I've also lost a parent yeah. or lost somebody and I'm really eager to have this experience and play it and yep. have that communal like, you know, mourning together over in the celebration of the people yeah. that they love. And, you know, I thought that that was a really special moment. And I, was, I told him, I go, 
You do realize it's like wildly ambitious and maybe you overshot it a little bit that you started your own game studio to do this. And he was like, well, you know, how else was I going to do it? And I was like, yeah, no, touche. Mad, mad respect for that. I get it. Yeah. Very much it. I'm, I'm, I'm also very much a like Thanos, fine, I'll do it myself kind of person. So I respect him so much for that. And I'm very excited to play the final game when it comes out next month. So to kind of wrap up this interview, because I know we don't have an infinite amount of time. Boo. I know. Just stop time, everybody. Here at GDC, have you heard any conversations that are exciting you about where the game development community is going? A piece of tech, a talk, a strategy, anything that you're like, that is some cool shit and I'm excited to see where that goes. So I actually attended a really excellent talk uh, yesterday in the Narrative Summit by uh, Jacqueline Seto and Crystal Rose Hazelton of uh, they're on the Apex Legends teams. Crystal Rose actually was just laid off, so if anyone needs a fucking amazing writer, Crystal Rose is on the market. Sorry, I will give you. I'll give you her Twitter, and you can put it in the put it in the yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but they did a talk about writing the characters in Apex Legends, and they talked about it was it it was writing for representation when you don't have it. So it's like as a writer, when you look like this, and you're maybe writing, you have all these diverse characters you want to create. How can you? get the right people in the room, consult the right people, like do it the right thoughtful way to have these characters that are authentic to specific cultures, authentic to specific, specific ways of life. And they broke it down into like explicit and implicit representation where explicit is their, um, their, mar their I don't want to say marginalization, that's such an awful way to put it, but like their qualities, like what they are, whether they're, you know, LGBTQ or they're, you know, from a specific racial background, explicit, that's part of their story. So there's yeah, how they identify yeah, themselves. Yeah. yeah, so it's explicit, which is part of their story. And then there's also I implicit, which is, let's say you have a trans character, but being trans is not part of th their journey in that story, but it's just, it's their identity and they, their identity is part of them, but it is not affecting their story and how you kind of can do both who you can talk to to do both when when to pick which one to do and like where it's appropriate where you need more work where you have to go the extra mile with consulting how you can consult other developers on your team that aren't writers to like look at this stuff for you and it was so fascinating and the talk was so good they it feels like a super important conversation. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, I mean, I very, I obviously have a, have a vested interest in that conversation, but it was just so wonderful, and they delivered it so beautifully, and it was, uh, like, it, it's to see it all laid out and broken down like that. I was talking to some people after, and it's like, we think about this shit all the time, but we've never actually, like, seen it just laid out and been like, huh, okay, this is what we can do. So, like... I think the, the subtitle of the talk was like writing what you know and what you don't. And like we like to think as writers that we can write anything, which whatever. But there's, you know, there are certain life experiences I've never had that I can't really write about with confidence. I've never been, I mean, I, I've never been, been, a, been a, a, a dude, but I write a lot of dudes. That was a really bad example. Sorry, backing me up. Um, <laughs> well, I think there's you know an I mean. element of like, I don't want to use maybe this term is the wrong thing to say about like fake it till you make it. And there's been a lot of discourse in the narrative writing community to, to remind people like you don't have to have lived experience to write no, fictional characters, no, but game writing specifically and how players have agency and embody these characters in a very different way than yeah. literature does, yep. for example, or screenwriting um, requires a different touch and a different perspective because players are embodying these yep. characters it's and different. that's what I think is so interesting about hearing these conversations yeah so it was great it's my, it's my favorite talk so far that you, you girls crushed it so proud of you oh congrats I love that yeah um, well, Alexa, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy week here oh, at GDC. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I'm just going to drop this breadcrumb to keep us both accountable. She mentioned to me, everybody, the possibility of a Final Fantasy VII Rebirth spoiler cast. I did, and I stand by it. I'm waiting for you to finish it. Okay. I'm, I'm waiting for you to finish it. I'm. It's part of my prerogative to finish. Brittany is like, are you done yet? Are you done yet? I go, I'm not done yet because I was playing Rise of the Ronin and I have Dragon's Dogma 2, oh which by the way, our Rise of the Ronin special episode is in the feed now. If you guys missed it, um, check it out. Brittany and I give our deep dive thoughts into the new game from Team Ninja. But I want to finish it and I want to have you back because I can't wait to hear what you have to say about it. Oh my God. So Brittany and I were texting. She finished it first and I was texting her throughout my, my, my time and like I, I, 
I should just read. We should just read off the text messages that that I was sending her, like in the in the time, but in the spoiler cast. Yes, because um, no yeah. spoilers here. No spoilers. I, I'm not even gonna say whether or not I liked it. I'm just need to talk about it. I need to talk about it. We'll talk I about want it. you to come talk about it with us. Yeah, we're gonna make it we're happen, everybody. It. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening, everybody. I'll have more thoughts from GDC, including additional hands-on information from the Nintendo Partner preview I was at, the ID at Xbox preview I was at, and other things that I saw and played here at GDC next week. So keep your eyes peeled for that and enjoy your weekend. Bye. Bye.